Good morning and welcome to Sunday School. This is Sunday School for July 19th, 2020. My name is Sister Evelyn and I do not own the rights to this music. The topic is the wisdom of Jesus. The Bible basis is found in Mark chapter 6 verses 1 through 6. The Bible truth says Jesus began his public ministry among his people but he is greeted with skepticism. Now, do you know what skepticism means? It's doubt as to the truth of something. It also can be a questioning attitude. Now, doubt is a feeling of uncertainty or lack of conviction. Conviction means a firmly held belief or opinion. The Bible says God is not the author of confusion and that we can go to God and ask for wisdom. Now, the memory verse says, And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him? And they were offended at him. From Mark chapter 6, verses 2 through 3. Now, there's two definitions that I wanted, two words that I want to define here. Offended is resentful or annoyed, typically as a result of a perceived insult. Astounded means shock or greatly surprised. Now the lesson aim says, by the end of the lesson, we will identify the reason or reasons the people in Nazareth could not accept the wisdom of Jesus. Repent of the occasions when Jesus' words made us feel offended instead of accepting them as wisdom and commit to accepting the words of Jesus even when they challenge us. Now, the life need for today's lesson says, some people amaze us by displaying unexpected wisdom. What happens when people show such extraordinary wisdom? Mark tells us that the people in Jesus' hometown were both astonished and offended by Jesus' wise teachings, and the religious leaders were incensed when Jesus' wisdom challenged their traditions. Jesus is rejected in his hometown. The Bible application says students will discern who to trust for spiritual guidance, yet know when a teacher is speaking the truth of God. There's two scriptures or three scriptures that come to mind to know Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 19, and I will read that. It says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Now, the lesson scripture starts off at Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. And that reads, And he went out from thence and came into his own country, and his disciples follow him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, From whence hath this man these things? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him? that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joses, and of Judah and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country, and among his own kin, and in his own house. And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief, and he went round about the villages teaching. Now, do you know the definition of unbelief? It's the absence of faith. And discern, I forgot to define that. To discern means to perceive or recognize something. And that goes with Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. And I've already read that. So life need for today's lesson. Students will understand how and why Jesus' own people were skeptical of his teachings. The introduction says, 
Mark, the shortest of the Gospels, emphasizes Jesus' actions more than his teachings, recording 18 of his miracles, but only one major sermon and four parables. He does not present a biography of Jesus that details his Jewish, Jewish family history. In fact, Mark does not quote the Old Testament or reference Jewish culture extensively, leading scholars to believe that he wrote primarily so that Gent Gentile Christians would know Jesus as the Son of Man and Savior King, who conquers everything from storms to demons to death. Mark 5 begins with Jesus and his disciples arriving on the east side of the Sea of Galilee in the region of Gadarenes and immediately being met by a man possessed with many demons. This demon-possessed man kneeled in his presence. The demons within him recognized Jesus and begged him to be merciful. Jesus cast the demons out of the man and sent them into a herd of 2,000 pigs that drowned themselves. Those who witnessed the deliverance and heard about it from the man as he shared his story throughout the copolis marveled at Jesus' power. After crossing back over to the other side, Jairus, a leader of the synagogue, confronted Jesus. Falling to Jesus' feet, Jairus asked whether he would heal his daughter, who was on the brink of death. On the way to heal the girl, a woman who had been suffering from bleeding for 12 years in desperation thought, if I could touch his garments, I will be made well. She touched them and was healed. When Jesus asked who touched him, she fell to her knees and confessed. Before Jesus and his disciples could get to Jairus' daughter, she died. Jesus reassured those present that the girl was only sleeping. Many mocked him. Unmoved, Jesus took her parents, Peter, James, and John, inside. There he resurrected her. These are the events directly leading up to Mark. Chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. Now a prophet impresses. Upon healing Jairus' daughter, Jesus and his disciples travel about 20 miles southwest, back to Nazareth, the area where he grew up. On the Sabbath, Jesus does as he would have for years, living in the area. He goes to the synagogue. However, instead of sitting to learn with others from the community, he returns on this second trip back to Nazareth as a teacher, a rabbi, traveling with his students. Jews were used to educated Jews were used to educated rabbis speaking with wisdom and authority, but Jesus amazes them. On the Sabbath day, he goes into the synagogue, a habit he has formed from childhood. Since he grew up in the town, he is therefore a familiar face to the worshipers and rulers of the synagogue. He is also familiar with the worship rituals and is no stranger. According to Jewish customs in synagogue service, which include scripture reading, Jesus reads from the scriptures and then begins to expound the word of God. The nature of his teaching is so profound that his audience and worshipers in the synagogue are amazed and dumbfounded at the wisdom with which he is teaching. They begin to question among themselves, from whence hath this man these things? Now, their wisdom comes from God. There is a good chance that many of the people have not heard Jesus speak before, and so this is their first experience. They are amazed. However, there is an undercurrent of skepticism among some of them regarding the source of his authority and power, as applied in the questions. Where does, this, where does this man get all this? And what sort of wisdom does he possess that all these miracles are wrought through him? Many probably thought it was disrespectful for a young man like Jesus to teach with more authority than the local elders who had more life experience. Wisdom is wisdom at any age, and this event should inspire all of us to seek the wisdom that comes from God, regardless of our age. A people offended. Their amazement did not lead to honor and respect. However, instead they were skeptical and offended. They questioned him, stumbling over the fact that someone so common and familiar to them could teach with such power. 
there was disbelief that a mere carpenter could be so wise and perform miracles, implying that such gifts could not come from God and thus must be from Satan. They insulted his heritage, calling him Mary's son instead of following the tradition of identifying children by their fathers. By their father. Now, growing up, Jesus must have learned carpentry from his chosen earthly adoptive father, Joseph. Before going into his public ministry at age 30, Jesus must have worked in that trade. Carpenters were regarded as common peasants, unlearned, at least not educated to the degree of the rabbis and scribes. Therefore, Jesus, to them, is just an ordinary man who worked with his hands as other common people did. The next question is both derogatory and demeaning. Isn't this the son of Mary? In the Jewish culture, men were not usually described or identified as sons of their mother, even if their fathers were dead. Describing Jesus as the son of Mary here is probably intended as a put down and perpetuates the rumor being circulated at that time that he is an illegitimate, illegitimate child because of the nature of his birth. Equally contemptuous are the next questions. Is not this the brother of James and Joseph and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? All this implies that he is an ordinary person that they know very well and probably grew up with. Why does he parade himself as a rabbi and a miracle worker? A prophet dishonored. Then Jesus told them a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his, in his own family. Simply reflecting on the events immediately prior to this visit proves the accuracy of this statement. A woman had faith that she would be healed if she could just touch his clothes. A leader in the synagogue had faith that his daughter would be healed if Jesus touched her. A man with many demons worshipped him, and even the demons recognized his authority. Yet in his own hometown, among his own people, Jesus only found a few willing to have enough faith to even come to him for healing. Some will not listen. Jesus' inability to work was not because he was limited in power, but because he performed miracles in the presence of faith. There was such a void that even he was astonished by their lack of faith. Sadly, this was a foreshadowing of how others would respond to him in the future. This experience also served as a teaching moment for the disciples who witnessed all of these events. This occurred prior to his commissioning of the twelve to go out two by two to teach and perform miracles. Among his instructions was, and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear you, when ye depart thence, shake off the dust under your feet for a testimony against them. He modeled what he taught, even though it was a verdict against his own people. As Christians, we need to be aware that some will not listen to our message, including those who claim to know Christ, some family and friends that are close to us as well. Now, there was some defining some words that I want to define to get a better understanding of this lesson. Familiarity. It's close acquaintance with or knowledge of something. Familiarity breeds contempt, extensive knowledge, and that means extensive knowledge of or close association with someone or something leads to a loss of respect for them. Or long experience of someone or something can make one so aware of the faults as to be scornful. The root, the, this root of contempt lies often in our own stereotypes and prejudices, which fuel hostility and the belief that those who are not equal to us are inferior. It also means to be too comfortable with each other. So Jesus, Jesus, they became too comfortable with Jesus and they could not receive. They could not receive. And sometimes it's hard to, he's saying in the word, showing in the word, he could not, um, he would not perform miracles because there was an absence of faith. 
And there's an absence of faith. There's almost like an absence of God. And we know that God is everywhere. But we always want to, we always want to have faith. The Bible says in Hebrews 3 and 19, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief is the absence of faith. And go down to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 11, and that says, let us, la- let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Now in Mark chapter 9, there was a father there that had a, a son that was demon possessed and he, he found Jesus. The, the word says, immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. So use this as an example. When you are struggling in your faith, you can ask God to help your, um, help you with unbelief, help you to come out of unbelief. And then go down to Mark chapter nine, verses 28 and 29. The disciples could not cast out the demon because of their unbelief. And Jesus said, and he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So familiarity, how do we, what are we supposed to replace? What do you think should be there instead of becoming familiar with Jesus? We're supposed to honor him. And do you know what honor means? It's high respect or esteem. The Bible says, if he be lifted up, he will draw all men unto him. And we have to remember to honor. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 13, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love and honor, preferring one another. Not slothful in business. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Now, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, If any fellowship of the spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy that ye be like minded, having the same love, being of one accord of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Jesus was honorable. He is honorable. Uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 17 says, Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. And Exodus 20, verse 12 says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And Leviticus 19, verse 32, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God, I am the Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they that they who labor in the word and doctrine. Marriage. Hebrews 13 and 4, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. The Bible says that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Ghost. Honor the Lord with your body. And God wants us not to be so comfortable that we dishonor him. We don't want to be comfortable in sin. Jesus is so wise. He doesn't want any of us to perish but to help with unbelief so that we can receive and know that is Jesus. We have to have revelation and and wisdom of him. And that was found in Ephesians chapter one, verses 17 through 19. And we have to continue to let our minds be renewed by God's word. That's why the Bible says 
and give us this day our daily bread. We want to eat the word and receive the word daily in the, in the name of Jesus. God bless you and thank you for joining me today.